Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm happy Pentecost to you. Pentecost. Uh, 50. 50 what? 50 days after Easter. It's, uh, for us it's Pentecost. For the uh, Jewish people of the Old Testament, it was called the week, Feast of the Week of Weeks, meaning 49 days. Three days after uh, Passover on the year that Jesus died, three days after was Sunday. The first Sunday after Passover day was always the celebration of the first fruits. Uh, those of you who are farmers understand first fruits really well, or gardeners. The first fruits, the first comings up of the barley, usually the spring was the barley to harvest. And, and on that third day, uh, at, at Jesus' time, because Passover was three days before that Sunday, counting Friday, on that third day then was, was the uh, first fruits. Then you have a week of weeks, meaning seven weeks of seven days, which is 49, right? And then on that, uh, on that 50th day, which would be the Sunday after the last uh, 49th day, uh, you would have the, uh, the whole crop uh, given, it not given to the, to the temple, but, but dedicated to the Lord, a Thanksgiving day, a spring Thanksgiving day. So what an interesting time for the Holy Spirit to send the Holy, to, to, to come into these people and gather a harvest of people that we know were 3,000 coming from around the Roman Empire. It's just so significant when you realize the little details uh, of, of things and God planning this at the time of Moses, 1,500 years ahead of time, knowing exactly that Passover day of Jesus' crucifixion would be three days before uh, Easter Sunday, what for us is Easter Sunday was for them the first fruit Sunday. So we, we celebrate today the first fruits as, as well as the crop. Uh, you're the crop and the Holy Spirit has come to the world, not just to the Jewish people, and, and turned, turned us to, uh, to Christ. So we celebrate today uh, thanking him 50 days after Easter for the, the grace that he's shown us. We'll follow, follow the order of service that's in your bulletin, and so we begin with hymn number 590, the Holy Spirit enter in.
worship here and throughout our lives in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us with your presence and love. Alleluia. We confess our sins before our Lord. People of God, by the inner working of the Holy Spirit, before we praise our triune God for working faith in our hearts and keeping us in him, let us remember why Jesus had to die to pay for our sins. Therefore, let us confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the children's address. Any children here, come forward. Okay, I'd like you to tell me what I'm, I'm um, going to tell you right now. God's ears, I don't feel spice and trunk, or taste and crystal almond. Yeah? <laughs> you know what I said? It doesn't, doesn't make sense. It's, uh, that's because I spoke a German prayer to you. Yeah. See, if I were to translate that, it's God is God, dear to you, sei dank, be thanks. But your Zeit on Fuhr for Speise, uh, food, und Trunk, drink. Durch means through, durch Jesum Christum. And then Amen, you guys know. Now, what if, what if we went around every day and you're speaking one language, you're speaking, you, you brothers at all? Okay. You're each speaking a different language. I'm not German. Okay, you go to the valve. But my point would be is you wouldn't be able to communicate with your brothers very well, and they wouldn't be able to communicate with you. They're saying something to you, you say, what? What is that? I don't understand what you're saying. Well, what we're having in the Old Testament reading today is the time when languages first began because of sin on man's part. God caused us to have many languages instead of one language. But even though he caused many languages, once Jesus came, he wanted to make sure that everybody could understand that Jesus came. And he gave the apostles an amazing power. All of a sudden, they could speak the German. People, the German people, there weren't any Germans back then, but the German people would have been able to understand what the apostles were saying. The people from France could have understood. The people from Africa could have understood. In fact, there were, there, there were people ranging about a territory at least 2,000 miles wide from Iran to, to Italy, and that all the languages and all the brogues that they had, they could understand what the apostles were telling them because the Holy Spirit gave the apostles the ability, just like that, to speak to these people everywhere so that they could all know that Jesus was their Savior. Now, think about this. You come from, uh, let's say, you've lived out in Denver, all right? You come to... Uh, Janesville for something special, and and uh, you find out in Janesville what the special thing is. You go back to Denver, and you can tell people there in their language. I mean, if Denver had a different language, but that's a thousand miles away. So you you would you would be able to have that ability to talk to other people and tell them what you saw in Janesville. 
isn't that smart of the Holy Spirit to cause at this big, big uh, festival where people come from thousands of miles and then they can take the news right back with them and be the first missionaries in their own countries. That Jesus of Nazareth, he is the one who died on the cross. So, um, yeah, it's funny to, to speak different languages, but the Holy Spirit's not going to let languages get in the way of him getting the message to the world. And he's going to use you guys in your life to get the message to a few people as we all meet a few people and can tell them about Jesus. So Holy Spirit, enter in and cleanse our guilty hearts of sin as you have so often done. It belongs to you alone. Holy Spirit, thank you for the, the gift of your, your uh, power our, that we believe, that we trust in you. This is a great faith. It's the only saving faith. It tells us about a God who really loved us to die for us on a cross. He didn't have to, but he wanted to because he knew we had blown it. We couldn't do it. We couldn't make it to heaven on our own. And th so we thank you, Holy Spirit, for turning our hearts and lives towards Jesus. Keep him uh, in us firmly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your time, guys. That leads us into our sermon text for today, the Old Testament reading, uh, taken from Genesis chapter 11. And since it is our sermon, I'll, I'll make my comments during the sermon on, on the special things that are in this story. But the reason it's chosen as a Old Testament lesson for Pentecost is because of the language uh, issue that this brings up. We find out how we had so many different languages. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, or Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. This is our Old Testament reading. Our epistle is taken from Acts chapter 2. This is the uh, Pentecostal account of the, of the uh, power of the Holy Spirit coming upon the apostles. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of them, each of us hears them in his own language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, that's Iran. Residents of, residents of Mesopotamia, that's Iraq. Judea and, and, and Capod, oh, I'm sorry, Judea and Cappadocia. Pontus and Asia, that's, uh, that's uh, Turkey, modern day Turkey. Phrygia and Pamphylia, also modern day Turkey. Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, 
They have had too much wine. Yeah, how many, how many, how many people do you hear learning a foreign language from having too much wine? <laughs> then Peter stood, stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, what God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is our epistle lesson for Pentecost. Our psalm is Psalm 104 on page 100. chapter of the Gospel of John, this would be Jesus in the upper room on the night before he was crucified, verses 23 to 27. And I'm going to invite you to read it along with me. We read the Gospel reading together. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words that you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Let us now continue with Nicene Creed and confess it together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with hymn 592. Savior Jesus Christ. Our text is the Old Testament reading that you heard before, just highlighting a couple of verses here. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord said, come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts this morning be acceptable to you, our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. What are you babbling about? What are you, what are you, what are you saying? What are you babbling? Well, we say that when we don't understand what somebody is telling us or what their language they're speaking or noises they're making with their mouth. And we'd say, what are you babbling about? Of course, the origin for that phrase is our text. 
And the very word in Hebrew used there, Babel, is what's called automata poetic. If you know a little bit of English literature, it sounds like what it is. In Hebrew, then, the whole idea is that Babel is supposed to sound like a bunch of nonsense. So when we talk about babbling, we're talking about nonsense. From our Creator God's point of view, the people of our text were pursuing a course in their lives, in the way they did things, that was totally nonsense from God's righteous eyes. In sinful pride and in foolishness that comes along with such pride and vanity, these people were so nonsensical as to shut out God from their, their priorities, from their way of, of lifestyle, from the way they thought and what they lived for. And instead, vanity entered their, their foolish hearts to shut out Almighty God from their responsibilities, their sense of accountability to Him. Their, their, their understanding of what they were for here on this world, their priorities and their goals in life. They couldn't care less what the Almighty had to say to them. And they had no interest in his law and gospel, in sin and Savior, in, in, in judgment but salvation through the coming Messiah in their day. There was no interest in that in the, in the parents, and they didn't pass it along to their kids because it didn't mean that much to them. What meant more to them is their own name, their own glory and fame and reputation. In arrogant foolishness then, the people's thinking and daily ambitions became worldly, materialistic, self-centered. Life is all about what I want, what I want to do, and so on. In other words, God saying, what a bunch of nonsense. That's not the reason God created us. These aren't the purposes and goals he had in mind for humankind. That's not the reason that he promised the Savior for us, so that we could continue going, doing whatever we want to do. Oh, Jesus paid for all my sins, but I can, I can do whatever. No, that's not why. But, you know, it's absolutely amazing how quickly this thorough corruption of the human race occurred after that tragic Noahic flood, probably just about two or three centuries beforehand, the, the human race was now right back down in the muck that, that it had once been before. But the incredulity that it might seem to you and me that it could happen this quickly is uh, kind of tempered when we look at our own country since the 1960s. And I think there's enough of you that reach back to the 1960s that can understand the kind of dramatic shift downward we've gone spiritually, morally, in, 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 our, in our priorities, who we're living for, what, what, what dominates our, our center of thinking, our focus, and so on. Some people now deny that God exists. They were gradually getting that way to begin with. We're going to look at that in Bible class a little bit more uh, as we look at the uh, human man, humanist manifesto. And, and, and the, he exists, and what, whether they even stand before a God in judgment, they don't, many don't believe there's a judgment. And many believe if there's a judgment, I'm a decent enough person that God will have to take me in because I'm certainly better than those guys and those guys over there. So on comparative ways of doing it according to human logic, not against to right, righteous, lo heavenly logic. So the, the spirit of Babel continues into our day, and we call it humanism, or some call it postmodernism. There are similarities there. Humanism is the belief or conviction that man, not God, man is the center of things. Man is the judge. Man is the focus of all things. And it firmly believes and it promotes that you can build a better society without God than with God. In direct defiance of what he, he had said uh, uh, before, it ignores, it avoids, it, it, it uh, tries to defy God's existence, it teaches that there's no moral standard other than what you want to set up for yourself and everybody can have your own moral standard. Humanism praises its godless philosophy yeah, and, and advances it in, in psychological counseling and leadership seminars, in science and the arts, in entertainment, sports, and, and uh, media, in literature, and the interpretation of history, 
in politics, in, in judicial decisions, in countless disciplines and, and institutions which seek to shape people's thinking and behavior and motivations and culture. Humanism is alluring because it's smooth talking. It appeals to our sinful and vain egos, to self-sufficiency, to self-righteousness, and to the human ability to accomplish great things in society apart from Christ crucified. Its ultimate goal, as in our text, is to establish a culture without a creator, a culture without a savior, needed, redeemer, and uh, at the heart and the motivation of, of everything. Now keep that in mind. As we investigate a more, this morning a story that probably all of you had in Sunday school at one time at least in your life, but now have had a better perspective of, of life in, as an older age that you are. As we consider our text under the theme, the gospel of Christ will not succumb to Babel's or Babel's monumental defiance and curse. By the time of our text, a number of generations had passed since the Noahic flood. In considering how the chapter prior to our text lists the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, it's not too hard to imagine that the population of the earth at that point was in the hundreds of thousands, if not possibly in the low millions. We also learn about a grandson of Ham, his name was Nimrod, a very ambitious man who established himself as a warrior hunter, but also kind of as a real estate guy in the sense of founding cities founding cities in the area called Assyria, that's modern-day Iraq, northern Iraq, and then also in the plain of Shinar, which is more in central Iraq, and, and the, where the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers flow. Nimrod was, a, was making a name for himself and uh, was in that area of what's called the Fertile Crescent that goes over the Arabian Desert that's in the, in the middle there. About 60 miles, Babylon was about 60 miles uh, south of modern-day Baghdad. One gets the distinct impression that Nimrod's extensive activity and his goals in life were quite proudly wrapped up and around urban development and making a name for himself. Now our text starts out describing a civilization shift going on. So apparently people from from further north up in the uh, mountain of Ararat mountain range were beginning to move down south to warmer weather, to, to flatter uh, uh, ground, to, to more temperate uh, weather so that they could farm better and, and, and uh, have a, a little better of a life. So they were moving down into that plain where the Tigris and the Euphrates are. A unique situation of the world at that time was that it had one language one common speech. Whether they were coming down from the Mount Ararat range or whether they were down in China already, they, they had the same speech. They didn't have to learn somebody else's language moving hundreds of miles. A unique situation then was this language that would affect commerce and, and business and, and, and uh, agricultural construction and so on. Imagine what our world would be like if it had just one language. It, it, you know, just what we could understand and comprehend what each other is saying without having to figure it out or, or interpret it. And even though English is kind of a contemporary quasi universal language, not everyone who uses it understands it fully, knows how to use it. The word order can be out of whack, and you go, What are you saying? Uh, uh, it can be humorous sometimes how things are translated. So, it, it would be wonderful to be able to have one, one world language. But Satan used that in order to try and rip people away from God. In the, look at all the wrangling, and, and despite uh, what we have uh, in our day, all the, the, I'm so, sorry, ahead of myself there. So having a single world language at that time was, was a great thing. And you had some of the social motivators of that time uh, whipping people up and saying, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. 
Let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. In pursuing that societal dream, that utopian type of dream, we are told that they would use bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Well, the tar that they used probably was a, a, a part of that hot pitch that boils up from the ground in that area of the world where there's massive oil reserves underneath the, the ground. And it uh, might be capable of with, withstanding, uh, easily accessible and capable of withstanding the hot uh, summer sun of, of the Arabian area. Meanwhile, the idea of unified sized bricks was a tremendous uh, opportunity for them to be able to build something much higher. Imagine trying to build a high tower with rocks of all different shapes uh, or, or, or uh, quarrying rocks, bringing them in from a quarry, well, all the work that you'd have to do to cut those rocks out and then transport them maybe hundreds of miles from the quarry. Making bricks, it was much more economical, much easier. You could make as many as you needed. So it, it was, and you could do facial work even on the tower, couldn't you? A facial brick, not just uh, for building the building. So great amounts of these bricks would be available and they could control so much of that building then. The building of that great tower and that city in itself wasn't as displeasing to God though as was the attitude of why they were doing it. Behind that, we read that, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. These people were not at all pursuing this task to bring the glory to God to do his will, but to make themselves renowned among the people of the world, to make themselves the trendsetters, the super people, the people that everybody wanted to follow, the, the, the people that uh, vanity swelled in their hearts as they thought this way. There's no mention of them seeking to, at all to bring glory to God through this. In fact, the whole idea of building a skyscraper they kind of infer was to move into the domain of God and show him face to face what their ingenuity and what their, their abilities could, can do in his face. Their goal was never uh, to encourage people to depend fully on God. Their goal was to bring glory and have dependence on themselves. This intentional goal of preventing the scattering of of people over the world, like God had told Noah earlier to, to uh, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, we, we have to realize that these people were acting in conscious defiance of what God had said. This was not his will. This was not for his glory. Their pride and, and rejoiced um, in, in their own uh, abilities, their own smart thinking to rely on external methods to keep each other to, together was their way of doing things, not to rely on humble hearts that found their unity in a saving God. So, this same humanistic godless attitude is among us today, even among people who claim to be Christian. God's rejecting his truths uh, don't, they don't appeal to people's lifestyle dreams. What God has asked is not what people want to do. Um, they want to make man the measure. They want to make man the judge of, of what everything is done. We see in efforts to rally people around every, any and everything except Jesus Christ in our day, it seems, as their good shepherd. The Lord's Day, Sunday morning, has now become compared to what it was a few decades ago, now the time to have all sorts of activities, whether they're sports or, or artistic things or uh, selling things or whatever it might be. Who needs God? He's given no glory. He's given no time. Uh, we, we, we see people taking great pride and excitement in the grand and glorious achievements of, of mankind, but they give God no glory. No credit for all the laws he put into our nature around us, for all the materials he's made available for us that we use in order to make our achievements, in order to get to, to things that we uh, are able to make. 
And then schools, instead of teaching about the Lord, teach godless evolutionary thinking. It all just kind of happened. It all came together by itself. It all developed by itself. There's no God. Again, we'll look at that with the humanist manifesto. The sexual behavior, it's up to you how, how, how you want to look at your gender or how you do sex and when you do sex and attitudes about marriage and relationships, uh, doing your own thing on issues of human life, about disciplining, cheating, lying, whatever, profanity, so much of that unravels then into anarchy. While humanism ridicules the Christian faith for making people feel bad about themselves, for making people feel they need a savior, humanism can't understand agape love. It can't understand the love of God that would save a people who can't save themselves, who would suffer for the people so that they could live with him eternally. Grab what they can out of the, get the, out of this life or, or either feel the great reward will, that will be your lasting legacy is how they think about what your purposes in life should be. Humanism's rally cry is up with mankind, not, not up with God. What mankind can do when we all just lock our, our arms together and move forward together, what great brotherhood we can achieve in that way and strive to make this world the utopia of peace that we all want to have. Because, of course, humanism doesn't live to prepare for eternity. Every now and then a great humanistic song comes out like, I'd like to teach the world to sing, or we are the world. And yet in humanism's worldly philosophy and ideals, look at all the wrangling. Look at all the breaking, breakdown in society it causes as people live for themselves, live for their desires, violent and lawsuits and scandals and lies and murdering, mass murderings. So last century saw the most, most killings, most wars, most bloodshed of all centuries, they would said, much less the, the persecution of Christians, the most persecution of Christians. The towers of humanism will always promise great things but lead to smoking pipe dreams. They are not sanctioned by the creator. They are not sanctioned by him but by the deceiver, Satan. They are not uh, sanctified Christians who, who approach responsibilities and tasks with thanks and, and praise to God in, in what they do. In our text, God commented that if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they do not understand each other. The Lord understands man's capacity for evil, for defiance, even though people are amazed. How could they have done that? The Lord could tell you how they did that. The Lord knows the domain of Satan. The Lord knows the evilness of our hearts. The Lord fully understands man's capacity for defiance. He knew that their united language would lead them to continue to be arrogant and, and self-glorious in their worldliness. And therefore the triune God decided among himself, it, their, themselves, it's interesting, they use us there, a hint at the Trinity there, the idea of Trinity, that, that, uh, to, that they would go down and interfere with their activity in a way that they would never, the people would never have imagined could happen. You know, imagine you waking up one day and turning to your wife and talking to her, and she goes, what did you say? And you just respond by saying, what did you say? And then on the way to work, you stop and see, you see good friends, and, and you say something to them, and, and they say, what are you talking about? But you're saying, what are you talking about? And you don't even understand that you're asking each other the same question. Or you get to work and, and the tar guys and, and the stone guys are trying to work together. Hey, I need a little, little, little bit more tar over here. And he has no idea. And the boss doesn't know how to, to tell people what to do because they don't understand him. And he doesn't understand them. It had just total confusion. And it forced them to separate, to spread out and fill the world like God had intended and told Noah to do. So the confusion, and, and, and so instead of having this, this tower of power to hold them together, it became a tower of ridicule and a tower of God's curse. 
So the, the, the confusion of tongues was a very great punishment. And to this day, it's still a major source of ethnic and national violence and lawsuits and scandals and lies and murdering, mass murderings, saw the, last century saw the most, most killings, most wars, most bloodshed of all centuries, they would said, much less the, the persecution of Christians, the most persecution of Christians. The towers of humanism will always promise great things but lead to smoking pipe dreams. They are not sanctioned by the Creator. They are not sanctioned by him, but by the deceiver, Satan. They are not uh, sanctified Christians who, who approach responsibilities and tasks with thanks and, and praise to God in, in what they do. In our text, God commented that if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they do not understand each other. The Lord understands man's capacity for evil, for defiance, even though people are amazed. How could they have done that? The Lord could tell you how they did that. The Lord knows the domain of Satan. The Lord knows the evilness of our hearts. The Lord fully understands man's capacity for defiance, he knew that their united language would lead them to continue to be arrogant and, and self-glorious in their worldliness. And therefore the triune God decided among himself, it, their, themselves, it's interesting, they use us there, a hint at the Trinity there, the idea of Trinity, that, that, uh, to, that they would go down and interfere with their activity in a way that they would never, the people would never have imagined could happen. You know, imagine waking up one day and turning to your wife and talking to her, and she goes, what did you say? And you just respond by saying, what did you say? And then on the way to work, you stop and see, you see good friends, and, and you say something to them, and, and they say, what are you talking about? But you're saying, what are you talking about? And you don't even understand that you're asking each other the same question. Or you get to work and, and the tar guys and, and the stone guys are trying to work together. Hey, I need a little, little, little bit more tar over here. And he has no idea. And the boss doesn't know how to, to tell people what to do because they don't understand him. And he doesn't understand them. It had just total confusion. And it forced them to separate, to spread out and fill the world like God had intended and told Noah to do. So the confusion, and, and, and so instead of having this, this tower of power to hold them together, it became a tower of ridicule and a tower of God's curse. So the, the, the confusion of tongues was a very great punishment. And to this day, it's still a major source of ethnic and nationalistic prejudices and, and barriers that we have which brings strife or wars. But God's undeserved compassion for this belligerent, defiant human race that we are would not let multiple languages now hinder the spread of his gospel of salvation once Jesus Christ came to this world. What did he do? It's almost like reversing Babel. On Pentecost, the apostles of Jesus suddenly began to speak in languages that they had never learned before. Languages of the people. People that stretched from all the way from modern day Iran, all the way over to Italy, and perhaps northern Africa, who knows how, how high up, maybe modern Turkey is in northern Turkey. And they had the ability to, to reach all of these with the languages that they were speaking. So many people from so many places were able to learn that day that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah for his people who was crucified on Passover day 53 days earlier for the sins of the world, including, including uh, the righteous, giving his righteousness to mankind in suffering for our sins. But even more, they learned that Jesus rose from the grave and there were hundreds of witnesses that could tell you they saw Jesus personally after he had risen and in that resurrection of Jesus he assured all mankind that the ransom that he gave of his blood was accepted by his father that you can have the sure hope of eternal life that you can know that your body can be raised by this living God 
uh, this ever living God and, and sanctified and, 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 and glorified forever in heavenly, uh, heavenly resurrection on the last day. For those who trust and are elated at Jesus' saving love for them, this is a marvelous message given us by the power of the Holy Spirit because we just would not believe without the Holy Spirit turning our hearts in humility towards God and knowing that he does not lie to us. Our God does not play games with us. So the saving message was so critical to the eternal future of these people that God made sure that there were no language barriers that would prevent the gospel from being then taken back by all these Jews who had come to Jerusalem, taken back home to their native areas and spread around the world. You know, isn't the mercy, the power, the wisdom, the way that God works and fashions things fascinating? Absolutely beyond how we could have ever thought. So the account of the Tower of Babel contains tremendous lessons for humanity about our God with the insights of the Pentecost story. And it's clearly a warning against uh, constructing our own little personal lives our towers of pride and our defiance of God and his word and his will because it will always end then in confusion, in strife, in heartache, in failure, much less in eternal judgment if there's no repentance at all. Scripture proclaimed God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. So let's not waste our energy chasing nonsense, chasing getting excited about alluring secular stuff that has no eternal future. It's all a bunch of babbling. We can never build or accomplish anything of lasting value without God's approval and his, his benediction. And so life is lived at its best only on God's terms, isn't it? when he is at the heart and focus of our life. So let's build our lives and dedicate our, our bodily temples of the Holy Spirit, not with ambitious towers of power on this world of self-righteousness and self-praise, but with humility, with Christ who has already built the tower down that reaches to heaven through which you and I can get access to heaven. There's a tower built that we can have through Jesus and Jesus alone. We will reach heaven and, and we will find the peace, the joy, the security, the love that we so desperately look for in this world, this world infested by sin and sin's curse. Someday we will be able to join all believers in one united voice in praise of our God and Savior Jesus. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. This time we'll continue then with him 588. <laughs>
give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. I trust the Lord from thee. Amen. We pray. O Lord, light of the world and saving strength of your people, we thank you for the gift of your word. Implanted in the hearts of your people so that set free from the power of Satan and the fear of death, we may live to serve and honor you. Pour out your spirit on us that we may grow richly in divine knowledge and spiritual understanding. Bless the proclamation of your word everywhere so that hearts may be turned from the darkness of spiritual ignorance, falsehood, and despair to the light of knowledge and truth and life. Be with our missionaries in our own and distant lands. Protect them, encourage them, and crown their labors with success. Let your word shine in our homes that parents and children may dwell together in love and serve one another in kindness and humility. Watch over the sick, the sorrowing, the anxious, and the weary. Preserve those who are in any danger of body or soul. Supply us by the grace of Jesus with the Spirit's power that we may ever be comforted by your truth and sustained by your love. For these and all other things you know we need, we confidently ask in the name of him who gave himself for us, that we might live through him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive with a believing heart the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. We close with the final hand. Strengthen all of us to be faithful to our Savior. Thank you.